Thank you for listening to Over Leveraged, where we explore the big macro themes affecting investors, economic imbalances, giant geopolitical trends, tail risks and tremors, and everywhere risks are not being fully priced into markets. Remember, trading carries risk and all opinions are provided as general market commentary only. Please do your own research. Our risk warning will follow at the end. Hello, welcome to Over Leveraged and uh, we are talking about the UK today. So we're back on home turf, as it were, and uh, very much um, a home fixture for uh, Helen Thomas, uh, who is back. Uh, very back. good to be here. Hello, Neil. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, so you're back from your travels. Only to Northern <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not that glamorous. But it sounds pretty glamorous to me. I've never been. But I, well, I should introduce you, shouldn't I, properly? Um, so Helen is founder and CEO at uh, Blonde Money, which is a, a macro economic consultancy um, and used to advise on politics to certain people, I believe. I was once an advisor to George Osborne, that is correct. So full disclosure, um, because we're talking we're talking about the Conservative Party a lot today and uh, we're talking about prawn cocktails and specifically the prawn cocktail offensive Mark II, uh, which is uh, all about the Labour Party uh, getting out and about in the city, wooing the city, and of course, it's a reference. Uh, I think it was Michael Heseltine actually who who first came up with it. Something about saving the crustaceans, and um, it got latched on by journalists at the time. So this prong cocktail offensive, and I think you know this is a theme that, um, as part of the discussion about the the travails of of, of the Conservative Party right now in the polls, um, what um, it will mean for the market and for the city uh, uh, if, as we expect, that that Labour do get in. Um, and what the impact might be on investors and and the stock market, and you might um, I guess wonder why why we're diving into a political uh, theme, but it is does it's where the sort of intersection of politics and markets, and that's that's kind of uh, one of the key themes uh, at over leverage. So that's um, one of the things that we like to discuss the impact of politics, um, or at least the out, the impact of the democratic process and political outcomes on. On markets, um, and today is a big day for the Conservative Party um, because it's by-election day. By-election time, which is it's kind of like one of those first-round FA Cup fixtures for those of us who are political analysts. Yeah, it, so it, King, Kingswood, Kingswood versus Wellingborough. Yeah, it's a, it does sound like an FA Cup. It time. does, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and it, it it will be probably just a sort of messy uh, and uh, confusing in places, I would imagine. Um, but very important ones, actually, um, because, I mean, these are the first by-elections we've had since October. Now, you might think, like Brenda from Bristol, oh, no, not another one. <laughs> but they are potentially significant. In fact, very significant for the future path of this government and for the upcoming general election. Do you, um, you want me to go into that in more detail, Neil? Or do you want to talk, I mean, there's some, well, some bobs on the market you want to mention? Yeah, there? well, I think, you know... So just as a sort of background, I guess, um, the Conservative Party is not... Well, it's, it's in government. Um, it's not doing terribly well in the polls with the, the voters. And so there is wide expectation. In fact, I think a firm belief that there's going to be an election this year um, and that Labour are going to win. Mm. So that's the kind of... Those are the assumptions that we have right now. And with these two by-elections, which are taking place today... Um, they are traditionally quite safe seats. Well, at least one of them is very safe. Mm. One of them maybe is a bit more of a kind of momentum swinger that goes with the you know the, the mood of the country, as it were, maybe a bit of a bellwether. And so this is going to have some you know important implications for the markets. And I think we'll come to that in a, in due course. We'll come to maybe what what the market is expecting and why that matters. But I, I think the main thing that we're looking at is is or at least that you wanted to discuss was this idea that maybe things are are looking quite bleak for the Conservative government, or at least for Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, and that, that he might not even be the, the leader by the time the election does come around. Yeah, I think the two parts to this which uh, everyone should look at from a risk perspective are um, who will be the Prime Minister going into that election and when is the election going to take place. And, sorry, I'm going to throw in a third one, which is that the result... Um, that everyone is assuming, oh, a massive Labour majority isn't necessarily as set in stone as it sounds. Mm. 
Let me start with that point, by the way, about the Labour Party. So something that doesn't get talked about a lot is just how far behind the Labour Party are in terms of seats because of the last election. So under Corbyn, it was so bad, it was their worst result since 1935. So if the net gain in seats for Keir Starmer is the same number as Blair in 1997, and the polls would suggest it could well be that, that scale of a victory, even if they won the same number of seats, they'd only have a majority of one. Um, so it's, you know, the, the point is that, that there's a massive mountain to climb. Now they're in poll position to be able to do it. Um, it, would, it would need to be, uh, yeah, it would need to be Labour's third biggest ever hall of seats to be this majority of one. Now, they may very well get the majority of 20 or 30, and particularly, obviously, Scotland is an interesting one because the SNP... Always, yeah. always interesting, Neil. <laughs> the SNP have been so dominant there, but back when Blair won, I think... Um, God, I think he had 40 or 50 seats in Scotland. I think 50 out of 72. Yeah, yeah. Over right, and yeah. now they've got yeah. one. Yeah. So there is, a, there, there is signs that, you know, that the Labour Party can climb this massive mountain but let's just say that they do take a huge number of seats it's uh, even worse than 1997 for the conservative party and then the labor party gets a majority of 20 or 30 well look rishi sunak's got a majority of well what is it now it's got a working majority of 29 Mm -hmm. but you know boris johnson came in with that huge majority having the majority doesn't mean you'll necessarily get all of your policies through because as we're seeing you know as each party likes to tell you, they are a broad church. But that does mean <laughs> that if 20 or 30 people are on an extreme could hold up your policies. So one important thing to remember here is that I think the market needs to wake up to the concept that even a big Labour majority doesn't mean it's plain sailing for that government or what they want to do. And therefore their fiscal plans could come a bit more unstuck. So that's that's point one. But well, as started. the Labour has already walked back, <laughs> oh, yeah, yet, yet very another, good point. Yes, they've walked back the twenty-eight billion yes. um, investment already. So that uh, you're seeing signs that already, yeah, which is causing that... still a ruckus within the party. Um, that this is it. You know, they're managing to just about keep on top of some of their internal debates. Um, for those of you who don't follow this as closely as me and Neil, um, the Labour Party. Well, Rachel Reeves had um, stood up. I think it was twenty twenty one in her conference speech where she committed to this 28 billion pounds of extra green investment it was sort of a Mm -hmm. bit of a um, bidenomics over here wasn't it the idea that you could do that yeah Um, but with as we've seen under jeremy hunt and the budgets that he's had to do you know his fiscal headroom is smaller and smaller if not indeed as the actually head of the obr called it a work of fiction which was the um (laughs) the uh the projections they've actually put in for what will happen in five years time so you know there isn't much wiggle room and they've they've now rode well the the strange part of what they've done in the labor party is they've rode back on their 28 billion pound commitment but said they still want to prioritize green investment so either they're cakeists, aren't they? They <laughs> want to have their cake and eat it. Yeah, That's yeah, the problem. Exactly. But yeah, it's a lack of ambition. I yeah. mean, there's a lack of ambition. But but what happens to them when they're in government? Do, do, does, does you know they, the heady excitement of actually being in power? I mean, okay, well now we're in. But usually it does the opposite. I mean, usually the reality, oh, reality check hits. of oh well, actually I you know we don't well, I don't want to suddenly lose twenty MPs because they don't really back me on this, and my majority suddenly becomes a bit wobbly. So they they. Mm, Usually, unless you're Blair and you've got a hundred majority, then yeah. it's very difficult. Well, absolutely, and um, and th- and that's where as well people were, you know, people voted for Blair and for his platform. What are they really voting for with Keir Starmer? There's certainly an element of this result that's going to be um, Conservatives staying at home or voting for for reform uk for example who, so yeah 10 percent 10 percent polling right now yeah, yeah. T- exactly now that's actually the, the what i really want to get into regarding these by-elections so the two by-elections in october they were good well one was a very safe conservative seat one again was a bellwether but um the margin of victory for the labor mp if you look at the number of votes for Reform UK, if the Conservatives had managed to take all Reform UK voters, they would have kept those seats. So the margin of victory on those two by-elections is small. It was about 
1,500 votes or something. But there was also 1,500 votes for yeah. Reform UK. Now, it's not, it's not a given that all Reform voters would vote Conservative, but it's clear that there is um, a leeching of the vote from the Conservatives that is opening the door to Labour. Yeah, and there's the Reform UK is there's sort of more right to the right, I guess, of the Tory party. It's, it's sort of the Brexit party kind it's of... It's the new Brexit party, which looks at a broader range of policies of a smaller state, cutting taxes, um, less, well, net, as they call it, net zero immigration. They don't like net zero on uh, climate policies, but they want net zero immigration, as in, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. people coming in but also going out must equal zero. But they do also want to build houses, for example, and they're looking at... It's one of those slightly quirky things where the bit further right you go on the political spectrum, you sometimes... It's a circle and you end up back <laughs> on the left. Yeah. Um, and they do some interventionist things. But, yeah. but broadly speaking, it's a, it's a right-wing party, yes, the Reform UK, of course, created by Nigel Farage and... Um, Richard Tice, Richard Tice from the Brexit Party. Mm. Now, what's important, so on Wellingborough and Kingswood, Wellingborough um, was in the top 15% of seats that voted to leave, so it is a very pro-Brexit seat. The candidate for reform that they've stood up in that seat is their co-deputy leader, so like the next, after Richard Tice and Nigel Farage, mm -hmm. there's a guy called Ben Habib, who was a Brexit Party MEP and a, a businessman and, and things like that, and he's, he's running in Wellingborough. And, of course, the Wellingborough by-election came about because of the... Oh, yeah, another scandal. You're laughing. You're giggling away there, aren't you? But it's Peter Bone. <laughs> uh, yeah, Peter Bone, who was a bit of a, you know, figure for the Brexiteers, but... Yeah. Um, and Mrs. No, no, no longer, no longer going to hear about Mrs. Bowen. No, no, exactly. Who <laughs> he did talk about on yeah, the record yeah. in in the Parliament. Yeah. And actually, it's his girlfriend who is standing as the Conservative candidate. So it's all a very strange setup. Right. But here's the point. So, so I told you that you know there was already a bit of support for reform in those last by elections when they were polling at five percent. They're now polling at double that. You could well expect. And they've got you know their man in there. You know in a in a in a seat that's. Yeah you know fed up with fed up with the candidate and like brexit and you know might want to give the conservative party a bloody nose etc yeah. kingswood um is a bit more moderate on the brexit side of things um the mp there has been there since 2010 prior to that there was a labor mp as you say neil it's mm. tended to go with how the national vote went um but and in fact reform weren't even going to stand a candidate but then they decided they would um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Allegedly, because all oh, people are asking us for it, says Richard Tice, um, and and then, and it's going to be um, another former MEP, Rupert Lowe, who's a, a farmer, a businessman, ex banker from Gloucestershire, kind of re from the region ish. Mm -hmm. But that's another really quirky by election, by the way, because the seat itself is being abolished yes. at the general election. So whoever gets this, well, it's going to be an MEP for months. So again, the turnout might be dreadful, because why would people bother? Um, and well, it's, these, yeah. it's these scenarios where you get shock results, um, going back to our FA Cup first round analogies. So, yeah. but, but what I want to get out here, it sounds like we're digging around in the weeds, but what's relevant here is if reform win one or come close um, or Labour don't actually perform as well as expected, yeah. it could re, and it will actually, it would reshape the narrative of this upcoming election. And it would throw a complete curveball into a lot of predictions because it's not necessarily the case. So there's one assumption that reform would hand Labour more seats because they'll take Tory votes. Mm -hmm. But there is also a narrative that some, let's say, red wall voters might want to go for reform candidates. And that could also eventually harm Labour yeah. chances. So we, we, despite this, you know, people have this opinion, oh, it'll be the Labour Party, they'll be sensible, don't even think about British politics, it's boring. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's quite the reverse. And these by-elections today, I think, will be the starting point for investors to realise, hang on, we could have an election any time, it could, might not go how we think, and um, the public could get, you know, really become quite volatile. Yeah, I think... Um... I mean, that's all, it's always fascinating, the by-election, I love the by-election, it always makes me think of Black Hat. Yeah, I was just about and, to and, say uh, that. The Rotten Boroughs. The Rotten Boroughs and the Stan Baldrick, uh, he's yeah. the retaining officer. Pit the, uh, pit the twinkle in the milkman's eye or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> such a good... Uh, Watch that episode, people. Yeah, but so I guess it's important to, to just 
get back to the fact of why are we talking about all this again and why does the, you know, as we referenced at the beginning, the prong cultural offensive and why does this matter? Um, so one thing on in terms of the change of government and why, why you know, why does a change of government uh, or why does specifically in this case uh, a new Labour government, um, why are we talking about it? What, what What's the point to the market? So we're going to refer to some figures here from AJ Bell. Um, and they looked at the FTSE All Share, which is uh, the FTSE 100, the FTSE 250, and the FTSE Small Cap ind Indices together, and that's recorded a double-digit gain on average in the first year after a government has been booted out. So when a when uh, a government does get uh, ejected, it does does bode well for the stock market. So we need to we need to consider that. Um, they looked at 16 general elections uh, stretching back to uh, 1962, which is when the All Share was um, formed. Um, so change in government uh, one year before you tend to get a 6% gain um, if the incumbent wins the one year before you get almost 12% gain but the, the key is afterwards So, and that, that makes sense because of course you've got a lot of uncertainty leading up to the election but then you get that great moment of clarity when the election happens so when an incumbent wins the, the average gain for the FTSE is just under 1% in the 12 months afterwards um, but when there's a change in government the gain one year afterwards, the average gain is almost 13%. Uh, so, you know, as, as AJ Bell says, the latest poll strongly suggests that a new government is likely and Labour is a favourite to replace incumbent. Um, according to the historical data, that's going to be a good sign for the market, uh, both in 2025 and beyond. There's a couple of things there. Obviously, there's the immediate sort of... Um, you know, risks and so on for, for, for the markets and for investors, for whether it's pound or whatever. But it's also just this long-term uncertainty uh, mm. that is maybe a factor for, for the UK market, um, mm. which is that really we've not really had a very strong, stable government for i mean even Bo i mean boris came in but was you know all over the shop from day one or despite his majority mm, yes. and, and of course covid was was a key factor in that so it's not it may be not entirely fair but there's not really been any kind of stability since 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 brexit and the point the point about it being unstable lack of clarity is that you know i think investors are really crying out for for some clarity in terms of growth projects you know whether it's house building and we've had this constant um persistent lack of house building for example um whatever side of the, the fence you sit on in terms of whether or not houses should be built on the green belt or on brownfield sites or where they should be built or how they should be built um there's definitely a lack of house building um whether it's the green um investment project that labor had been touting and has now walked back um again as we said at the beginning that the fact that they're walking that back is a sign of the lack of sort of mandate lack of real ambition and confidence that they have that they could govern in that way so there's not really the confidence in uh, government to shape policy um, in in a pro-growth in a decisively pro-growth way that was seen i think maybe with the the trust and quartang experiment as well there's this lack of confidence in government being able to shape a pro-growth policy and that does have an impact on investors and it does have an impact on the market Therefore, you know, the, the more of a dominant uh, uh, election win for either the Conservatives or the Labour Party uh, would would matter. And so these that's why these by-elections and, and sort of looking at how close things are really does matter. So yeah, I was going to say, since, since 2016, David there's, Cameron, there's effectively really, been a risk premium, hasn't there, on, yeah. on UK assets and, and over even, other countries. Yeah. Understandably, even, even if you... Whatever you might think politically, as you say, the uncertainty factor is high. Well, and uh, this is um, a topic for um, an upcoming um, podcast, so we will we will talk about it in more depth. But it's this uh, the discount that UK equities have to mm. the rest of the world, to the US, to the Europe, um, which is about forty percent. And if you look at the the discount multiple, the you know price to earnings charts it all starts in 2016 so even if you're a, a believer in brexit and so on the, the charts don't really lie and, and and there is this discount that's been applied to the uk market to uk equities since then yeah and the idea that that disappears under a labor government well quite and 
is certainly a Labour government that won't have a majority, like, as you yeah, said. Yeah, really a strong and stable yeah, majority. Yeah, strong and stable, yeah. But it's a semi-permanent yeah. feature of UK of politics UK. now, yes. which does affect the market. And I think people maybe, it just becomes background noise. But actually it does matter, um, the yes. fact that the pol- political scene is, is still quite unstable. And, uh, sorry, um, my, and I should also point out that with Reform UK grabbing the narrative and momentum, yeah. then Rishi Sunak comes under even more pressure and we get back to the original point, which is... He, he could be replaced before an election. In fact, the, yeah. there's been a leak, you know, the, the suggestions now are rather than November the 14th that he wanted for a general election, he wants to possibly push it to December. He might think more time helps him, but unfortunately more time gives his enemies time to mass their ranks and, and yeah. affect their plots. Because I'll go back to when the Brexit party came out, um, it was polling again around 5% in April of, I think it was... I can't remember what year it was now, when Theresa May was still, just before she went. But in any case, the Brexit party went from 5 or 6% in the polls to 26% in the polls. Yeah. So that's really the factor that we all need to look at when we look at... It's not actually just the British electorate, but it's no. particularly pronounced here, which is this splintering where people are politically homeless, don't know which party to go for, and that will lead to volatility for our governments because it would be very hard, for whoever wins, for them to pull together a, yeah. a coalition of people who agree with them. Yeah. It's not enough to just hate the other side, but there's a lot of hating of the other side going on. Not <laughs> yeah. just here, of course. No, it? it's, a, it's a feature of, of polarisation of the politics yes. that, we're, that we're seeing. I know, certainly, the, from, for Sunak, it's not, uh, not looking too good. He's got 56 MPs stepping down. Um, combined with resignations, by-elections. So there's some people saying it could top the 72 MPs who stepped down before 97. Mm, so that yeah. was when Blair came in. So it's that sort of picture of a um, multi-year Tory government and lots of people abandoning shit yeah. at the last minute. Well, you know, the one seat that keeps coming up is Jeremy Hunt's as, mm. as vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And you've got to think for him, he's, he's, done a, he's done a pretty decent job now. His political legacy might look relatively solid he he may benefit him to step down as well ahead of the next election and just yeah, be, can... be done and that that would be pretty high profile wouldn't it i mean that would be pretty dramatic i think that that would definitely be the death knell for... <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so boris johnson uh, will leave for now but yes. nigel farage so we've been talking about him a bit with reform mm. um, well there's an interesting question here which is does the reform party is it able to stand on its own two feet as a party does the conservative party just disappear now that's that, that would that's it's, been it, touted many times yeah. over the decades yeah. over the and the same for labor actually um but it's it, it is difficult to, to dislodge our legacy parties and it takes decades the machinery the machinery is, is yes yeah, is, is, yeah. is, is huge and difficult to battle mm-hmm. um having said that um could you get a reform conservative pact post an election is there like almost a reverse takeover does <laughs> reform back itself into the Conservative yeah. Party? Do, do, do people stand as reform MPs and then defect back to the Conservatives in a new government? I mean, all sorts could happen, actually. And I think there's yeah. a... Although, it's all very Peelites and... Uh, oh, it, yeah, I was going to say, we're getting back to... 1832 We are getting back to... Uh, yes, yeah. we are. Uh, exactly. We shouldn't... When we talk about the legacy parties, I mean, we have got a history of parties changing. It's yeah, just, they do. It just... It, it happens. Hundreds of years. It takes every hundred years, maybe, to. But to happen, you know, yeah. there's yeah. The, the seeds are being sown, so I think it's extremely unlikely um, that Farage would become head of the sort of Conservative Party because I think he was I mean, he's kicked out of it thirty years ago. But he might quite like to be asked. I'm sure he would. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, in all this, we, we've got these by elections taking place. Um, the fact is that we think probably Labour are going to win, but they're not necessarily going to have the same kind of level of majority that maybe they would like. Um, but we're going to find out a bit more over the coming weeks and months, I guess, whether or not if Sunak is still going to be leading the Tory party yes. come the election, and that's going to be that's going to be a factor. Yes. Um, there's a poll from a survey by um, Bloomberg uh, last year, which it's interesting. It shows a, a change in the narrative. So that traditionally, the city likes Tory governments. Um, it's meant to be good for the market and so on. Mm. But now, 44% of professional investors favour a clear Labour victory. Twenty percent favoured a Labour coalition, Labour-led coalition. Twenty-five percent preferred a Tory victory. Um, 
an 11 percent the tory coalition so there's well, been a shift starmer's definitely yeah and they've done uh, a lot of work change. you know um rachel reed and keir starmer yeah. meeting people from the city and there is yeah you know there is a lot of they're sensible people they've done a lot of work to know that the corbyn way was never going to work and they've been on the you know it's the the perception they've been they've been yes. able to shape the perception yeah. and you know it's the prawn cocktail offensive oh, again know. when was the last time you had a prawn cocktail man I oh, do I like, have, oh, I like one. I go down the harvester, get one there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, what's more of a city thing now? Probably a, um, oh, some sort of... Scotch egg. Oh, you're thinking, <laughs> you're, you're, you're thinking proper classic city. I was thinking more, you know, what's it, a, a, a banana and kale superfood oh, smoothie. Oh, right. Oh, no, no, no. Smoothie offensive. Oh, no, I've what never. What you need for... Yeah. We're, we're too old for this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, not, we're not the modern No, I'm, I'm more of a scotch egg and sausage roll type. I'll let Rachel Reeves know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess the thing is, the, the sort of takeaway is that really there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and a new Labour government doesn't necessarily change that. No, exactly. Get ready for much more uncertainty ahead, starting with these by-elections. Great. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. That's, thank you for... Thank you for listening to Over Leveraged. And um, we've been talking about UK politics today. Um, stay tuned for um, upcoming episodes. We're focusing next time on Russia and NATO and Trump and what it all means on the anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So stay tuned for that one. Thanks for watching and listening. Remember, all opinions, news, research, analysis, prices or other information is provided as general market commentary, not as investment advice, and all potential results discussed are not guaranteed to be achieved. The information may have been derived from publicly available sources, company reports, personal research or surveys. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. Trading carries risk of capital loss and the service is available to professional clients only.